Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is David Penny. Uh, welcome <laughs> this morning. Uh, I'm the uh, uh, Associate Director for Museum Scholarship uh, and Public Engagement, and it was my great privilege to be able to work with the Wanda and Robert to help bring the fabulous exhibition Robert Cool, Red is Beautiful, here to the National Museum of American Indian. Um, it's upstairs in the third floor. If you haven't seen it yet, it's open. I hope oh. you'll go up there oh. uh, after you had a chance okay. to um, listen. So uh, our purpose today is just to have a really informal, we no, hope uh, informative really and interesting no, conversation no. between Robert Hool, uh, our guest uh, as uh, artist, uh, uh, Soto Anishinaabe artist who uh, <laughs> born in uh, Sandy Bay community in Manitoba, currently in, in Toronto. He's accompanied by the curator of the exhibition, uh, Red is Beautiful, Wanda Nanabush, curator of indigenous art at the Art Gallery of Ontario, and our special guest uh, this morning, uh, Robert's old friend, an old friend of uh, the National Museum of American Indian, Kay Walking Stick, uh, the painter. You. So we hope to uh, generate a really interesting conversation. Um, on the, uh, and I'm just gonna make a small adjustment here so we can get this on the, um, You'll be seeing a series of uh, illustrations uh, of um, we've selected from their work, uh, which will be scrolling behind us. And if we feel like it, we may stop and pause and talk a little bit about uh, something. But uh, basically, this is there. You'll see behind us there. It'll change slowly. Uh, examples of Robert's work, which is included in the exhibition upstairs. And one of the interesting things, of course, is that um, both Robert and Kay were really pioneers as indigenous artists uh, in the United States and in Canada and bringing modern contemporary uh, artistic language into the conversation of native art. Uh, at the time when they're working early in their careers, 1970s, 1980s, uh, it was very unusual for artists to work in this way. So, um, But I'd like to start actually by asking uh, Wanda to talk a little bit about this uh, fabulous exhibition and uh, your role in bring it together and working with Robert. Well, this is the namesake for the show, which is Red is Beautiful, which is a work done in 1970. It's the earliest work in the exhibition, and it marks the beginning of Robert Houle's kind of professional career. So you can imagine it's the first work he sold, and it was sold for $90 <laughs> <laughs> to the National Museum of what was then of man, <laughs> then it became of civilization, and now it's of history, so you can feel the shifts and changes. Um, Robert was also the very first uh, curator of native art at the, that same museum, um, and famously quit, <laughs> and we can talk <laughs> about that at some point, but not right now. Um, Red is Beautiful also is about Robert's um, colorism. He's like a colorist. You'll see these big, beautiful color fields um, and the relationship of feeling, emotion, intuition, symbolism that comes with color, and healing too, if you wanna talk about that. Um, and then finally, Red is Beautiful is the movement, you know, Red Power Movement and all of our resistance movements that plays a huge factor in Robert's uh, personhood, but also in your work. Um, you were one of the first artists to bring to light a lot of our land land um, blockades and fights and resistances and the way we hold on to our the legacy of the ancient ones as I'm quoting an early essay of Robert Hool. So I'm really excited to be here. David became interested in the show right from the beginning and uh, you can talk about that and then for the catalog I called Kay. I was like do you want to write for Robert Hool? And then I sent, sent some stuff to you and you were like, we're kindred spirits <laughs> as artists. So it was quite lovely and thank you so much for being in the catalog. Um, and thank you, Robert, for trusting me with 51 years of your practice. And um, he, he said, I want my retrospective by the time I'm 75. So we made that happen. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for having us here and I'm really happy to see all your beautiful faces. I, I wonder, Kay, if you would talk a little bit about um, you, you both, you and Robert, as I mentioned earlier, were, were pioneers in you know, the kind of artistic language they were bringing into the conversation of Native art. Um, can you t talk a little bit about your early experiences as an artist and how your art was received and working in this way? Um, <clears throat> that's a lot. That's <laughs> a lot to talk about. 
I had been working in, uh, figuratively, um, in the uh, late 60s and showing a bit and decided to go back to graduate school. Uh, so I went to graduate school, I was 38 years old, and I went to graduate school um, and I wanted, I wanted to be a better artist. I mean, the point of going to graduate school for me was just to get, be a better artist, a stronger artist. And um, I also realized at that time that I it was time to face the fact that I'm an Indian. And my father was an Indian. Um, and my grandfather was even a famous Indian. And so I come from this, this family who I identified as native, and here I was living in a white culture in New York City. So coming to, uh, to work, I, I needed to make art, because that's the only way I really communicate is through art. And that's the only way I really understand things is through art. So I started making paintings about my identity as a native person. And um, I, I didn't know my father at all, but I happened to, he happened to return uh, for a brief period in my life. And I asked him, who would you identify as a great native person? And he said, oh, well, of course, Chief Joseph. So I did a whole series of paintings, uh, which you will see here, uh, about Chief Joseph. But I did them not in a realistic way, but in a, an abstract way. I was trying to express ideas through minimalism. And if you're familiar with early minimalism, it's certainly not conducive to expressing content. But I wanted that, uh, those images, to express what went on with Chief Joseph and that great tragedy, but that great strong fight. Uh, so I was using what was contemporary at the time in New York City to express these things about my um, native history, as well as American history, because native history is American history. I think that's one of the things that, as a young Anishinaabe person um, who became engaged with both of your works, it's so freeing to, to think that art made by Native people is Native art. It doesn't have to look a certain way. It doesn't have to necessarily follow the kind of um, standard way in which we're told it's, this is Indian or this is Native or this is Indigenous. Um, that was part of the freedom you both created, I think, in, in art. Um, I was gonna ask you, Robert, because you started from abstraction as well. So there's a section in the show called Sacred Geometry, which is like that early work when you were grappling with abstraction. Do you want to speak a bit about that? Sure, and I'm delighted to, to be here and also to share with you my, my first uh, venture into uh, abstraction and geometry. There's an American um, woman who was uh, commissioned by the, uh, um, uh, by, the gov by the federal government in Washington I, I don't know how Lyford. Lyford. Uh, Elizabeth Lyford. And um, I was a student at McGill, and uh, I, uh, an art student in Montreal, and we were asked to um, paint love. Well, mm. I really didn't know much about love at that time. I mean, <laughs> I had a lot of affairs, but uh, you know, it wasn't <laughs> love. <laughs> 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 and, but I, I found a book by Elizabeth Lyford, and she had been commissioned by the, uh, in Washington uh, to um, uh, make a study 
of uh, beadwork designs. So they were all very geometric, uh, the leaves as well. Uh, and I bought that. And um, I would go back to my class, my students, because we were asked to paint love. I, like I said, I didn't know really what n love was. And, but they were making paintings like uh, uh, Andy Warhol at that time, in, in that period, in, uh, in the early 70s. That's how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said, no, I don't want to do that. I, so I found this book by Elizabeth Lyford, and it became my Bible in many ways uh, about geometry, uh, because she had done a research on all the beadwork designs um, by Native Americans. And it became my, uh, my, uh, my partner for a long time. <clears throat> and, uh, uh, but my first painting from, the, from those, uh, from those uh, designs by Elizabeth Lyford were um, uh, designs like this, you know, geometric designs. I looked at my classmates painting love. They were painting Andy Warhol and all the other things. And, I, I didn't know very much about him at that time. I had just come out of the reservation and I was on my way to Montreal and I was at McGill and so it was, everything was um, brand new to me. So I had to create something, and, but I fell in love with Lyford's study of beadwork designs and it became um, my Bible. Uh, that's yeah. what attracted me to um, geometry. But not only that, uh, as a person from the prairies, uh, I come from Saskatchewan, just, uh, I mean Manitoba, uh, just north of, um, uh, 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 what's the name of that state? Dakota? Uh, yeah, north Dakota. Yeah. And <clears throat> I never realized uh, that our people, the Sotos, um, we came, uh, uh, we were, I was invited uh, to a, a reception. Uh, I was then curator at the National Museum, a man curator of art. Uh, um, Prince Philip and Queen Elizabeth, they all stand and then uh, they turn around. People stand around them and, and then my turn came. Um, Prince Philip turned around to me and said, so, uh, Soto, where are you from? And I said, I'm from Man Southern Manitoba. He, no, no. And I said, oh, of course he's going to tell me off. He's going to know more than I do. Finally, I was wrong. <laughs> and he said to me, he says, you guys came from Wisconsin. You know, you, are, you speak the same language. <laughs> so I said, wow. I quickly changed my mind and I started talking to him more nicely. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was my beginning. The first painting that you saw, Red is Beautiful, is, is from the Lyford uh, uh, study on uh, beadwork designs. And, uh, but I eventually, of course, outlived it. Um, by the time I went to Salzburg to study painting, I quickly, uh, not quickly, but I s quietly pushed them aside. And, um, but geometry, became um, um, instilled in me for some reason until I found out another way of uh, articulating these the beautiful geometric patterns and designs. Um, uh, <clears throat> Brenda Goreshko was a high school sweetheart. She moved to Vancouver and I moved to Montreal. And I said to her, I, said, I wrote to her and I said, could you help me with her? And then she sent me, um, a, a, a series of love poems. There were about fif 15 of them. And I tr translated those into my uh, uh, geometric patterns. And that was the beginning. And my first painting that I ever saw, it was at the Hotel Bonaventure in Montreal. And I had made this little painting based on these designs and uh, never sold a painting in my life, I was just a student. And Canadian Gildercraft, uh, came up to my booth and said, would you like to uh, 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 lend us your painting? We'll, we'll put it in our, in our um, booth. I, of course, you know, this is the first time I've ever heard of anything like that happening. 
so little there, and I saw that some man came up to me, who later was a colleague at the National Museum of Man in Ottawa. Uh, uh, he says to me, he says, he comes and says, can I talk to you? And I said, yes, sure. And um, I'm a young man, I'm just, just flattered. Uh, and he says, can I buy one of that red painting? And I just said, Oh my God, I had never thought, I'd never put a price on it. And I said, $10. <laughs> <laughs> That's my first painting. <laughs> and uh, the rest is really history after that. I just, I just got more and more comfortable and um, uh, did a whole series of love poems from Brenda in Vancouver, sent them to Montreal. And I did a series of uh, paintings based on geometry but based on love poems that she had written to me. And that really became the, the beginning of, of my um, assertion that this is what I was going to do, you know. And, Thank um, you, Robert. Yeah, and those love painting poems are on display, many of them upstairs, with those poems. Uh, and it's really beautiful to, to see those. But I, I was struck with um, how, um, a poem is not, it, it's not a narrative, it doesn't tell a story, but it evokes a feeling. So I wonder if you, could, if you could talk a little bit about how painting, your paintings are intended to evoke feelings, uh, an emotion around often these very big issues, you know, they, kind of these heroic issues around the, the birth of Canada, the Kanata or um, Sacagawea, the leader of men. Um, so these abstract paintings, but dealing with these big heroic themes. Is there, um, is there a question there for me? Is there a question? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think maybe talking about Kanata is a good way to go because you've got these two color, color blocks oh, on yeah, either side. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Kanata, yeah. Yeah. Oh, no. Okay. I'll get it. I wanted to paint something that was related to our, uh, to our country. And um, so I chose one of the major, major works that the National Gallery of Canada owns is a huge uh, Benjamin West painting. And, but I appropriated that and I put up red in, in, uh, uh, on, on, Blue, uh, yeah. on either side. And, and I used to collect, oh, this one, thank yeah. you. And this is uh, uh, that Oops. painting before is uh, Benjamin West, an, um, an American painter. And the National Gallery of Canada had a, uh, a copy of that painting and um, appropriated it too. <laughs> and that's, that's what. Why did you, oh, why did you strip, yes. strip, why did you strip the color out of the middle panel? Well, I wanted I wanted the uh, uh, the um, uh, the national colors, uh, the red representing uh, native people and the blue representing um, European Canadians. And then the highlight on the Delaware. Oh yeah, he's the only one that I wa wanted to sort of color rather than the rest of the painting. Uh, <coughs> that was me. Yeah. There's also this funny little story of the canoe that's way up on the side. Oh, yeah, if you look at it in the corner right over there near the red side, you'll see, because uh, the, the painting didn't have any native people in it except for, for the warrior, but over there they're, they're canoeing away in a, uh, <laughs> uh, out of the scene. Uh, <laughs> they're just like that <laughs> corner. Yeah. It's like it's a private little uh, the, in the yeah. know thing. Of course, at that time, um, in the early 70s, to make decisions like this was very radical. People were just literally um, uh, lifting things and not really, uh, sure, I, li I, I would um, uh, lift some, uh, steal something as well, but I would always um, add myself to it, meaning I would change things and I would change color and, uh, you know, and I would eliminate some figures or add some figures that are, were missing. Like in the far corner there, there's, there's a native person canoeing away from the, from the scene of the death of Wolf. <laughs> so little things like that. And it became my signature work. I, I was very happy uh, about that. 
And then I, after that, I, I went back to the geometric painting uh, I, with um, for love poems. Mm -hmm. I really I read one love poem and then I would paint it in in, in the geometric symbols that I've been using. That I I, I know seeing uh, Kanata when I was sixteen. So that's <laughs> 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 and um, it does give, like, as a as from it gives our perspective on history. It gives, centers our understanding of the the country. It makes it clear that these sovereignties are kind of battling it out on our bodies and our land. Um, so I thought that that was cr just truly brilliant and really gave us some power, you know. <laughs> That's what I, I really like about the ambition of Robert's work, you know, and, and Kay's as well. And, and you're choosing to deal with these, these big heroic themes. And I wonder, Kay, if you, what, you, you mentioned a little bit about uh, your inspiration with your father's comment about Chief Joseph, but you've always tried to deal, how, how is it that painting can address these big humanistic themes, or how do you think about that in your work? I think that part of it is that I was raised in a very religious household. And uh, Robert was raised with a, a very strong religious background as well. And you know, once you have dealt with the idea of God and God in your life and God walking with you, uh, nothing seems uh, too large to handle because you already are dealing with the biggest concept you can possibly deal with is our selfhood in relationship to the cosmos. So I think that the idea of uh, dealing with big issues is part of what we have in the back of our heads. This is who we are. Um, the other thing that you mentioned, something about what painting meant, and I happen to be in love with paint. I, many of my paintings are very dense. For years I painted with my hands so that I was always covered. Um, and paint is magical. There is something, you, you, paint is actually the paint I use, which is oil paint, is mud with uh, usually inorganic materials like cadmium or cobalt or uh, Mars black, for instance, and Mars red and all, or stone. So we're, and uh, red oxide is just red stone. So we're dealing with the things that are primal to our mm -hmm. earth. We're dealing with these very simple things with oil so that they're mixed with an oil that is usually a vegetable oil. And consequently, you're taking something that is absolutely simple, the simplest kind of combination, and turning it into storytelling or at least, if not storytelling, at least expressing ideas that are uh, common to us all as humans. And so I see that as a magical thing, that you're taking something that's so simple and turning it into something that has a voice. Mm. And paintings have a voice. And this is very strongly seen in both of our works, I think, is that there is a, we have a message to relay. That leads so perfectly into, because I think you both work in a similar palette, because with premises for self-rule, you're using ochre and there's mm -hmm. a color palette there. I wondered if you could speak to that. <coughs> well, <coughs> things I began to learn uh, at the university at McGill, and then I also went to Salzburg because uh, the art program at McGill University was not strictly um, um, uh, painting. 
I remember uh, what started my paintings about geometry and, and taking and studying uh, Elizabeth Leifer's uh, study. The, um, the professor wanted us to paint love. Hence also the story after that about the love, about the love poems from, from Brenda Goreshko in Vancouver and then sending them to me in Montreal. Um, <clears throat> I slowly got into, into, into my own, and I, my classmates were painting, uh, uh, imitating a lot of uh, American you? artists, Andy Warhol, the Hearts, you know, those, those, those period. I didn't want to use them, not because I didn't like them, but I wanted, I wanted to uh, start something on mine, my original, and hence the, 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 the geometric forms, and also using pastel colors at that time, uh, acrylic. But I quickly changed uh, uh, five, ten, uh, ten years later, to, I went to oils, and I have stayed with oils ever since because of their, uh, um, I think, I think where I really got it when I was a curator and I came to visit uh, Kay Walking Stick um, when she was living in New York. And I was uh, curating an exhibition at the National Gallery in Canada. And so she was one of my choices. So I went to visit her. And man, I saw for the first time in real life um, a, a studio, paint everywhere, paintings everywhere. And I said, oh, I just, inspired me and I said oh you know you don't have to put away your paintings or your your paints and you, she can live with that and I said I can do it too so it became a lot more um, easy it's a lot easier to to just pick things up and, and everything and continue or put it aside you know and I'm quite happy to have met Kay walking stick she inspired me and, and the untidiness of the, <laughs> of the studio. And I said, no, you don't have to clean it all the time. <laughs> Sorry. <Bruce is> out. <laughs> Do you want to tell the, you remember making the pines? Pardon? Do you remember making the pines? This work right, oh, Oops. there. This one. This one. Sorry, I'm oh. trying to zero in on it. <laughs> there we Does go. Does not want to leave it on there. Sorry. Um, the pines. The pines. Yeah. So you you told me the story of. Oh, oh this is a, this is this is actually from um, in, uh, an incident conflict that happened in uh, Montreal. Uh, it was in the um, Mohawk community of uh, Kanasatage. And, and there was a big conflict between between um, the feds eh? and and uh, over land. But I knew this place. I had I had met one of the um, one of the elders there, and he invited me to go and visit. Uh, I'd never been in uh, step foot in um, Mohawk territory, and I was impressed. And then a, a few years later, there was a big conflict. And um, they were, they were um, on, um, could you help me on this story? Yeah, so it's 1990 and the government sends in the military against a small group of Mohawks who are defending their land. The town nearby wanted to turn their sacred grounds, these pines that you're looking at right here, into a golf course. And this is where they're, they bury their dead and where they do their ceremony. And there's a, there was a, um, uh, cemetery there, and when I went there to see for the first time after the conflict, I saw the I saw the graves there, and and that really really uh, asserted uh, what I had decided to paint, and it took me a while, but I'm I'm very happy with with uh, with, with the work. This is a very I used to teach Mohawk painting. children it at is. the Longhouse. Um, I would, uh, for free, I, I would come in and uh, um, I would spend Sunday afternoons there. All I wanted was have the, um, uh, the guy that was running the program to uh, pick me up and, and get me back to, 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 to uh, Montreal from the Mohawk uh, territories. And I had children uh, as, as, um, as. 
at first when they thought, they said, no, 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 we don't want to play Indian. And, you know, they would say, and I said, no, 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 no. And I asked one little boy, I said, can I paint your, can I give you war paint? Next thing I knew, I had everybody, <laughs> I had everybody uh, <laughs> with war paint. <laughs> And then they would sing, and then they would bring me later, as they became more comfortable with, with me after about three or four visits, they took me to their longhouse, and they performed for me. I thought that was the greatest gift for me. Mm. Thank you. Okay, I wonder if you'd talk a little bit about your recent projects, but having to do with particularly with places uh, and uh, indigenous land. This happens to be Canada. I, I brought this painting for Robert. Uh, this, is, this painting is called O oh Canada. And it's, um, you know, I, I can't remember the names of those mountains, and I, they're somewhere in my brain, but I can't come up with it. But they're very prominent. I mean, they look like um, a flat irons, and you can see them from a great distance. Um, very prominent mountains. And the pattern is uh, Stony Nakota. And these, um, I had a lot, I researched the patterns. The patterns I use on my um, landscapes today. And I use them because I want people to recognize that this is Indian land. And as a matter of fact, we are all, every American, is living on Indian territory. And so I, I, I present these paintings to remind people where they're living. But the other thing I really want people to recognize when I make these landscapes, I try to make them as beautiful as I can. Uh, they're never as beautiful as the place really is. But I try to make them beautiful because I want people to remember that we have this beautiful planet and we must take care of it. So that there's really two central themes to these paintings. They're very big. Um, they are uh, oil on wood. So they kind of have a permanence about them. Uh, and I always go to the place that I'm painting because I think that a painting is not only a picture of a place, but it's a memory of a place. So it's important for me to have the memory of the place, the color, the smell, the feel of the air, the look of it, all in my head so that I can use all that memory to convey my thoughts about these places. Um, you can fairly ask, why aren't you still doing abstraction? I found that for me, I couldn't say as much as I wanted to with abstraction. It is true, others can. Uh, I couldn't. I wanted to convey more about our Earth than I could through the abstractions. The patterns are patterns from specific tribal groups. This one that's right here is Northern Cheyenne beadwork. Uh, the Stony Nakota on the Canadian mountains is also beadwork, as I recall. Uh, many times I've used uh, parflesh bag uh, patterns so that there are specific peoples who have lived and still live, usually, on specific landscapes. Uh, so I'm telling, I'm telling a rather large story about uh, people and their relationship to the place. I think that Native people, all of us, are very connected to our land, our, our place on the planet. Uh, we've always been here. Mm. It's, it's our place in the earth. Uh, so that's what's being established. And 
the other thing I want to mention about the Estonian Nakotas is they were, the Canadian government closed the land to these people completely. They weren't allowed to step into this, what became uh, national, uh, uh, I don't know whether we call it parkland, but federal land. They were not allowed there, and I think about 10 years ago, that changed, but for many, many, many years, they were not allowed to return to this land for any of their ceremonials or anything. So in this particular painting, it's also about the fact that these people are finally returned to their traditional homeland. Robert, you too as well have, you know, you talk a lot about being a sun dancer and yeah. coming from those traditions, and you've also used the parflesh as a structure for your painting. But I would like to <clears throat> share this with, it's a very sad story, but that's what made me very strong. Um, when I was seven years old, I was apprehended from my parents' house and taken um, a mile away to the residential school. It had uh, five floors. I would go up to the top floor where, the, where we had our classes as, as young, as young, um, as young kids. And I could see my parents' house from those windows. It made it even more painful because we were called um, savages. We were prohibited from using our sacred names. It was a horrible, horrible time. And you know what? It was my art that helped me uh, heal or anger uh, from, from the residential school. But something interesting happened, not interesting, something nice happened. By the time I was about 12 years old, the nuns would always ask me to do uh, Christmas uh, scenes on the blackboards. So I, would, so I got an uh, early encouragement about, and also the nuns were, were, were very nice to me because I would paint, uh, not paint, I would use chalk for their, in their classrooms, on the nativity scenes and, and things like that. But it's not been uh, a nice childhood for me, and for my sisters as well. We were allowed to go home on Friday, and we would, when we would, when we would leave the residential school, the, um, Marcel, Vivian, my sister, and my sister Catherine, we would, we would dance and sing all the way after we left the building and got home. And um, that's what kept us alive, and our parents were very nice to us about it. And we also spoke our language in the house. Uh, we were, pro of course, forbidden. Even though the priest, uh, the, uh, every Sunday, we, uh, my father refused to go. So I asked him, how come you don't go to church on Sunday? You're, you're a Christian. He says, I don't want to go. Uh, your mother is going to pray for me anyways, but I don't <laughs> like her. <laughs> and, and the point is, you know, uh, he would say, look, uh, there's, I said to him, Dad, why, there must be another reason. Yeah, he said, I don't like sitting in the pews, in the chair, in the benches, and the priest has to give a lecture or whatever it's called. And he would blast everybody that we should, and so and so was having an affair with this, and my father hated that. I said, why should I go there, you know, and listen to a man that is, is just a priest? <laughs> but, you know, and I never really understood that until, until much later in, in my life. Residential school was a hideous place, full of abuse, full of denial. It made me feel really, really awful. But when I got, but when we went home, sang in Soto all the way through, and summer, summer solstice comes, 
parents, my parents, my best part of the summer, would uh, leave the house with a teep with a teepee, and uh, uh, there's a sacred ground on our reservation where no no waste is made there and or thrown there, and they would build the wigwams, the, the, the Sundance lodges, and I would see my my old aunts and uh, coming to to dance and. And it was nothing more beautiful to be in a tent and to hear the bells, uh, the, 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 the bells around me, and the drums. But my favorite part was the Windigu Karnak, which they're, they're, uh, they wear masks, they have long noses, and they're, uh, they're, um, we were all always scared. And we would, my mother would say, cook special bannock, and we would hang it on little, on little tripods. So the 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 the, the mystery the mis uh, well, Winnie Kanak we call them, they would come with arrows and they were really silly. They would they would try to pull their uh, their arrows, but it would go the other way. <laughs> it would go. The, they were um, um, clowns, I guess, in many ways. And those are my wonderful memories. And then also seeing my aunts come from their other reserves, and they would dance in the wigwam in the in the Sundance Lodge. And, and to hear those drums and those whistles till about uh, uh, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night and, and be before you go to sleep. But those are gone. Those are gone. It's very painful. And um, Robert? I even have difficulty talking about it now in, in, in terms of memory. But I wanted, I wanted to share this with you. It was not always good. Slapped across the face mm. if I spoke. My language, Robert. I wonder. But if I still speak it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I wonder if you would talk about the uh, parflesh and uh, the, the significance of parfleshes to you in your work, and the story about uh, naming ceremonies in your home. Yeah, the parflesh medicine uh, uh, bags. These, this is this is what we would put outside our teepees uh, and during the during the sacred ground, and they were all around. It was a lovely time. It's June the 21st, this, the period where the sun is at its highest point. And that was a holy day for us, because the sun was our father. And it was nice to see all these women in ribbon dresses and coming in and dancing and the, and the jingles making noises. I mean, <clears throat> That's slowly going away too now, the younger people. Um, uh, but I'm happy about this. And I'm very happy to share this with you. Well, I'm a sun dancer, and I believe in that. But I will go, I will go to church and ask for, for help with, uh, with, with Jesus. <laughs> I have, we've been raised, especially our mother, not our father, uh, to, 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 to go to church on, on Sundays. And, and my father said, I, I'm not going to church. That priest is going to talk about my affairs. <laughs> <laughs> well, you kind of, in 1983, you made par fleshes for the Last Supper, kind of dealing with the, the you know, both, both kind of religions that are inside your soul and spirit. Par fleshes for the Last Supper were based on, on that uh, piece, yeah. So. Yeah. I remember you talk, told me it was like um, you didn't want to think of them as separate because you're one being. So oh, you yeah. wanted to talk about the continuity between the Catholicism and Sundance and who you are as an artist. I, my reservation, everybody speaks our language, Soto. Uh, maybe some younger ones are, are don't. And I don't, it's, a long, it's a long history of just the resistance and the intention of speaking the language, even though we were punished for speaking it if we were caught. But as soon as we left the building to go home, yakety yakety yak away in Ojibwe, <laughs> yeah, and both my parents were uh, speakers, and, um, and some of my aunts were sun dancers, so we would go to all these uh, sacred uh, ceremonies and slowly, uh, as I got older, uh, less and less of that now. Mm -hmm. It's been a while since I've gone to a Sundance. It's a good time. It's when the sun, our father, is at its highest point. And that's when we, uh, we break the fast. 
That, when I was doing research for your show, um, I was researching um, the documents around the residential school system, um, in particular Sandy Bay, where you were when you were a kid, um, and they, there's all this uh, government report saying, these kids will not stop speaking their language. So it was actually known as one of the schools where you just refused. Um, mm. So it was part My of was the very resistant My reserve just simply refused to, to follow that. So uh, yeah. when I go home, um, the number one language is Soto or Ojibwe. Good. And, Good. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to be a speaker. I, I haven't lost it. But when I do go home, though, my father, my late father, he would laugh at me because I would miss some accents within a word. <laughs> so that would always, that would always embarrass me. <laughs> David, why do you think it's important to have this show come, come here? Well, um, first of all, it, it's, I think we're always looking for um, you know, great contemporary art, but you know, contemporary art, plays a big role at National Museum of American Indian and has for a long time. And, and a part has to do with you know, a number of sort of major kind of messages. I think that uh, many, some of our visitors sort of feel that, or at least their perceptions of American Indians are sort of trapped in the past. Um, and there are of course those familiar, all too familiar stereotypes about the past. But contemporary artists really are of here and now. And uh, they're, off, they're dealing with these big issues as we talked about but also um, uh, a very contemporary people, you know, engaged in the world. So I think it's, a, it's, it's important for our visitors to understand that American Indian history, art is not simply about the past, but really about the present and the future. So we look for artists like Kate Walking Stick or Robert uh, to bring to our visitors to help them expand their notion of what American Indian culture is, what it can be, and what will be in the future. Excellent. May I say about this painting here, is that this painting is a diptych, and it was probably the first diptych that I did. Uh, I have done diptychs ever since. This is 1980, and that painting was entirely painted with my hands, and it was layered with acrylic paint mixed with a, a, a a wax-like material, a saponified wax, so that it has a, it has a body. The paint was um, like painting with thick mayonnaise, if you can imagine that. <laughs> and um, so that the, there is a, a quality to the paint that uh, looks like earth, actually. Mm -hmm. um, it looks, or ceramics material, or it's, it's very dense, so it doesn't look like a painting of an illusion of something. It looks like simply itself, like a piece of sculpture does. It's just itself and nothing else. What's it's called warm, cool, cool, warm, reversal, or maybe it's cool, warm, warm, cool, reversal. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> And Robert, I, I think I got involved with making unusual material because I wanted my paintings to be identified as my paintings. I wanted them to look like something that no one else was doing. So I was the only person that was using this material. So it, uh, it is true, I finally stopped using it. but. I, it, I think that it was about identity that made me find it. Hmm. Did you want to talk about Ganasage X? Yeah, we could, but Robert. I'm curious. Do you remember why you put arrowheads in this? The arrowheads? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I, had, I had gone to Saskatchewan, which is a province uh, after Manitoba. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, I, I was there uh, at the school to give, a, to give a talk. And this young um, um, boy, young boy, uh, came up to me and he says, um, I found this in the field. 
yesterday or, um, with my father, and I would like you to have it. So I have kept it all, all these years, and, and, uh, and I've used it. I still have it. It's, it's in a very special place in, in my bedroom. But this, this is the, uh, the, the paint, uh, that little arrowhead. He had found it in the field, in, and then uh, I was on the truck with him, and he said, here. <laughs> and I thought that was a, a most important present that I've ever been given, and I still treasure it today. And it's just a simple arrowhead, you know. Is it a sign or a symbol also of the longevity of us in this territory, in this land? Absolutely. And, um, You know, it's a narrow head is food, not itself, but it makes it when you go hunting and, and stuff like that. But also, uh, uh, during the sun dance, these little objects become there. And you'll see people uh, m making a hole and then wearing it uh, as well. Uh, and different kinds of materials. I don't know very much about it because uh, I, all I know is this one, uh, that piece that I have. It's still it's it's in the it's in the China cabinet along with uh, with fancy things. I, I, I consider it very special. I consider it. Uh, my father told me he says, you know, these are sacred objects. Be careful with it. Mm -hmm. So I, I I I've even though he was more of an atheist, and he didn't want to go to church, he didn't want to go to the Sundance, uh, but my mother was, and my aunts were there, and I would see aunties uh, in their long black dresses uh, during the, uh, uh, the highest point of, of the Sundance, which is uh, uh, straight up, you look, and it's, our father is hanging directly above your head, and the women would come in their long dresses, and they would be wearing moccasins, and they were, would have uh, um, arrowheads like that, that 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 they were wearing as, as necklaces. So this was very special to me. I still have that piece. No. I treasure it. When I was a girl, <coughs> which was 150 years ago, of course, but when I was a kid, uh, I lived upstate New York, and we often found arrowheads. If we were out, you know, not in the city, but outside in the, in the suburbs or in the, and further out, there would, and I've often wondered about, uh, we would find them in the field, you know? And have any of you found an arrowhead in the last yes. mm -hmm. 50 years? <laughs> yes. yeah, have you? That's wonderful. I oh, certainly haven't. And it's like, did we find them all then? <laughs> <laughs> no? Not yet. <laughs> um, anyway, I, it was very special to find these things, but it was also expected. Somehow we knew that they would be there for us to find. Uh, I don't feel that way anymore. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, it's a past, a thing that's past. I've learned so much from the, um, K. 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 <laughs> I'm senile, sorry. <laughs> Join the I club. Was, <laughs> I'd been hired by the National Gallery of Canada to, uh, to do uh, uh, an, an exhibition of Native American and Canadian Native art artists. So I traveled all over North America and there's one artist that I wanted to know and visit in New York City, <laughs> and it was Kay Walkingstick. With the and messy <coughs> studio. I was totally With the messy studio. Uh, yeah. um, uh, uh, amazed. I walked into her studio, and she had everything everywhere. You know, and me, when I'm in my studio, I have to clean everything. <laughs> and I was so impressed. Oh, and I fell in love. <laughs> no, um, and I realized that you know um, there is um, there is a reason for uh, just leaving your paints there, you know, for the moment or for the day or even for a while. And uh, I keep my brushes clean, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's good.
You've t oh, sorry. I was going to. We're, I think we're getting close to. Yeah. Uh, we've been uh, you know, sort of looking at some of the reproductions of the work upstairs, and you know, also with Kay's uh, with uh, Kay's work. And I think you can see, really, the um, the relationship and the differences between their work and how, why they're such special artists. Um, but uh, I guess I would like to conclude. I don't know if Kay, you want to say anything in conclusion or. or um, well, yes. I want to say that uh, the NMAI has been a great supporter of Native artists ever since its inception. And I am very grateful to the NMAI for having this wonderful show of Robert's and a, a wonderful show of my work as well. It was, I realized, seven years ago. Mm. but. <clears throat> The NMAI has been great supporters of us. And I also want to say that it's wonderful to see Robert's work here in the States in such a beautiful exhibition. You deserve every accolade that anyone gives you, Robert. You're my hero, too. <laughs> <laughs> and Wanda, I think I'll let you have the last word, and then we'll uh, conclude. But um, thank you for so much for bringing this exhibition to us. It's, it's thrilling. I think uh, our visitors are just going to um, uh, be overwhelmed and, and delighted. And it's here until uh, January, uh, no, next, uh, for an entire year, will close in June of 2024. So we'll have That's be living terrific. with it for quite some time. Yeah, Wanda? I want to thank you for bringing the show here and for the institution for doing such a beautiful job on the install as well, and to all the staff who made that happen, and uh, to all of you for coming and listening today. Um, he sometimes calls me last word, so um, I think it's hilarious. <laughs> 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 I think really, Robert, you should have the last word, not me. Okay. <laughs> it's in deference to you. I didn't hear you. Do you got any last words? That sounds <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's rephrase that, rephrase it. I didn't, know, that, I didn't, I didn't it. know I was dying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my oh, goodness. Oh, We've what? used the worst language today, like pioneer. Like, we're <laughs> not pioneers. <laughs> uh, anyway, funny. I am so proud to have been here to talk to you. And um, I speak my language, Soto, Ojibwa, mm -hmm. because my entire family speaks it. That's one thing that is, uh, that's the language in the house. And, uh, uh, and that's why my entire family, and 50% uh, of my, re my reserve uh, still speak our language. And, and they, they also teach um, uh, Soto in, in school. They're in, we're encouraged, and um, and we still do the annual sun dance. There's a section on our reserve where no waste is done. There's nothing. It's just left like that. And when uh, when June comes, uh, they start sort of cleaning stuff from from where some people still will drop things, and those have to be. Then that has to be cleaned, and then we would pack our our, uh, either our tents or our teepees, and we would build them around. Uh, in the center would be the Wigwam Sundance Lodge. And at night, it's the most beautiful thing to see the jingles, uh, mm -hmm. jingle dresses sounds and the slow drums because it's at night. But the other thing that's really funny, I always like to share that, we have, uh, they would come around noon or afternoon and they would be looking for food, and they wore all kinds. They're like clowns. They have long noses, and and everybody. I used to be afraid of them at that time. I mean, I, I, mean, I must have been about ten, uh, eight years old. <laughs> and they would come to all the different, and we would put, we would hang. And my mother would uh, um, make some bannock or bread and put it and put it on little tripods, and so the, to please the um, the windy hukana so that they will not disturb us. <laughs> we were always scared of them. 
That's a good note to end on. <laughs> <laughs> Practice your respect. <laughs> and thank you so much for being here, and please see the show. Thank you. 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 Now get out of here. <laughs> <laughs>